or a bunch of heads in that town, or is it, is it just basically you, and your MC5 and Stooges? Well, MC5 and the Stooges, it was just me mm. for a long, long time. But then, of course, 1977 or into 76 was when both here and in America, the Stooges fans began migrating to larger communities and meeting each other and starting bands. I mean, the Stooges were a much, much bigger influence on American punk and hardcore than even, even the Sex Pistols were. Well, they're pretty big influence here as well. What's that? They're a pretty big influence here. The Stooges say every town would have one or two Stooges fans, and that's kind of... Yeah, and eventually country. people found each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, did you have any notion at that point in time to actually make your own music, you know, form a band, or find like-minded people, or... When I first got into it as a seven-year-old, there was a primetime TV show on called Hullabaloo. And why my parents turned that on and let me watch it during dinner once a week, I have no idea. They might have been fascinated with it, but, you know, Beatles, Stones, Animals, a long-time favorite. I saw Eric Burden in the middle of a punk rock festival at a different venue in Las Vegas a couple months ago, and he just slayed the room. I mean, I'm no sorry. Eric yeah. Burden, no Jello <laughs> That's yeah. the way it goes. If I reach a proto-punk band, the animals. Oh, yeah. Oh, was, yeah. 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 And, and, uh, but they were on this show, along with American bands who are now considered the, the, the better-known garage ones and whatnot. They were on there, too. Mitch Wright and the Detroit Wheels, the Young Rascals were on there. Uh, oh, how can I space on the other ones? I was amazed at how well I remembered every single one of those bands on that show when I finally saw it on DVD again a few years ago. But the minute I saw it, I was like, this is what I want to do when I grow up. I mean, there was a little bit of a detour when the Batman TV show hit. You know, and other kids were writing in third grade, You're, when I grow up, I want to be a fireman. I want to be a cop, I want to be a baseball player, and the girls, of course, I want to be a nurse. I wanted to be the Penguin. I wanted to be the Riddler. They were my childhood heroes. And, oddly, that's, you kind of managed to pull that one off as well. <laughs> they won't hire me for the movies, though. I just don't have as big a name as Jim Carrey for the Riddler or whatever. It would have been fantastic. He did a great job, though. He did better than I would have done. So, so, like, so we've got this kind of really, sort of, I imagine quite a quirky teenager who's been, uh, who kind of knows a lot of facts, a lot of stuff. Your parents turned you on to a lot of interesting information. Well, so plus I was, I was a news hound yeah, really, yeah. really early, too. And that's come from there. And, and yeah. you've got this kind of like really underground musical taste. And you want to make music, but how, how do you do it? Well, that was, that was what made me nearly one of them teen suicide statistics that Tipper Gore and crew would blame on Ozzy Osbourne. Because right before punk happened, it was pretty damn grim. You know, the activist wild side of the hippie thing had kind of petered out, and I was still at hair down to here, I occasionally washed and uh, yeah. love, love that kind of, you know, they, they, you know wore, wore my freak flag with pride. But it was like, it, you know, but, but to actually be on stage in a band, all there was for somebody like me who liked heavy music was arena rock shows. And then even at the club level, you know, music was for the adults who paid their dues and could all play as good as Jimmy yeah. Buffett. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so there was no way in. Nobody. Nobody when we were teenagers thought of, like, let's start our own band. It was just unheard of. I mean, there were a few people who tried playing electric guitar, and they all got into prog rock. And one of them became, um, two of them became masters, actually. But, uh, and I know them both to this day. But, um, no, it was just unheard of. Even after punk began rumbling, it was least unheard of to me until that moment many other people went through with one band or another. Some people have even come up to me and credited mine as the show they go to that changes everything. And that was when rumor hit 
that at this uh, major label showcase club where everybody had to sit down, nobody was allowed to dance, where they would try to break to see who's going to be the next Eagles or the next uh, Scientology jazz fusion person like Chick Corea, one of those. That was a, those were two main things they trafficked in in that place. Called, it's called Ebbets Field, named after an old sports stadium in New York. I think it was owned by a guy who used to play in that thing, an old baseball player. But anyway, rumor comes in, hey, the Ramones were opening for Night City at Ebbets Field. Let's go. And would you, would you be the only person in town at that time who knew anything about the Ramones? No, because I found the first album in a dollar bin the week it came out. Some stores sold their promo straight away. I'm like, well, they kind of look like the New York Dolls. Maybe this will be good. And uh, put it on and thought, what is this? This is hilarious. A minute and a half long songs. Beat on the brat with a baseball bat. Now I want to sniff some glue. Now I want to have something to do. So I go around to all my other friends when we were listening to like the good side of Prague and Crowd Rock and smoking a bunch of weed and put the Ramones on. And we would all laugh and love it. But it was connecting. So then some of us realize kind of the significance of this and go down to Ebbets Field to see the Ramones. They're opening for a record company band that didn't take off called Night City that had Ray Manzarek from The Doors and Nigel Harrison in between Silverhead and Blondie and whatnot. They were that plus a prima donna singer from hell who threw tantrums all the time and stuff and no real sound to call their own but no hit singles so they never took off. But anyway, so the, the, the local glitterati and, you know, the record company people were all there. The guys who paid their dues and had corduroys and jackets with patches and shades and feathery status quo looking hair. Their girlfriends all had fresh 20 dues with flowers because Joni Mitchell had just started doing that. There they are, just waiting for what they're supposed to watch later. And out come these four degenerate looking guys with black leather jackets and one chord on Johnny's guitar and we knew it was going to be way louder than we thought it was going to be. And of course they blew the roof completely off the building and it was, you know, it was so powerful and so amazing. It was like, God, this is so amazing, it's so simple. Anybody could do it. Ah, even I could do. I got more stage moves than Joey Ramone. I've never even been on a stage. So the gears began to turn, and out of that one Ramone show came Dead Kennedys, the Wax Tracks label, Angst, who did four albums on SST. Don Fleming, who went back east and did Velvet Monkeys and Gumball, and now works for the Alan Lomax Folk Archives, which is an amazing place you should go to. And uh, who else came out of that? Um, the local punk band who got to open for the Ramones the next night, when the friend of mine who worked at the record store talked the club and the Ramones into letting them have a night of their own, so they just stayed and played. And um, suddenly they needed an opening band and got the local kind of punky band called the Ravers, who would later move to New York and change their name to the Nails and had a hit single in America. Actually, I don't know whether it was over here or not, called Any Lines yeah. on 40. John Peel playing the album. Yeah, okay. So those Nails used to be Colorado's first punk band, the Ravers. And suddenly, when the Ravers were going to open for the Ramones, suddenly they needed what was then called Roadie. So me and my friends were the roadies for the Ravens for the next six to nine months before they moved to New York. I felt ten feet tall. All you people in my family and school, all you bullies, fuck you, so I was always going to be a loser and never amount to anything. I'm a roadie for the Ravens, man! Oh, that was going around the whole of the USA. Hey, you know, just play later, later with the nails, they did yeah. a little bit. But when you, when you were roadying for them, yeah, that was only a day. Okay, around that Yeah, so, yeah. So, this, is this I was the one they didn't take to New York, which turned out to be a good thing, yeah. because then I had to follow my parents' wishes and give college a try out in California, in Santa Cruz, 
And within a week or two of arriving, I figured out where the punk shows were going on in San Francisco and went to Mokuhei Gardens. And arrived to my chagrin after painting it in, it was heavy metal night. And up until that point, I kind of liked both, but those bands were so bogus, it was kind of the schism that happened with a lot of people where a lot of us didn't even listen to Black Sabbath for another 15 years. We were so put off by that whole thing. And these were not Black Sabbath kind of bands. These were bands that would make you wish you were at the status quo concert Prince Charles attended or something. You know, they were, they were that stuff. But there was this one punk rock guy walked in. My friend, look, look, that's a punk rocker. Look, a real punk rocker. And he's, mm, and they just totally fucking with the metal bands with a couple of other people. And then my friend Mike Ellis said, hey, wait a minute, I know that guy. I think it's my friend. Because Mike had gone to a high school for Americans in London. And sure enough, it was his friend Russell Wilkinson. So he moved, brought me over to meet Russell. Turned out Russell had changed his name to Will Shatter, if that sounds familiar. A few of you are going to know who he is. And, uh, and then he was like, oh yeah, you like punk? Yeah, are you in a band? Uh, no, I can't really play anything. Why should that matter? I've been playing in bass for two days and I'm in a band. We're playing tomorrow night. And so the next night was my first punk show at a little space somebody carved out on 8th and Howard Street. His band was Grand Ball, and they were completely incoherent. But uh, the other band that night was the Avengers. And, uh, yeah, have they ever brought the Avengers to Rebellion or not? As they do play every once in a while still. They're still pretty damn good. A very, very important band to me. And um, so uh, that was kind of my end of the San Francisco punk scene. Still had the hippie hair and everything. That went a little bit later. So, <laughs> so people were yanking on it that night. <laughs> oh, at that point in time, did you have a kind of vision for that? Well, let, let, let's finish with Will Shadow, then we'll go to that yeah. question. Because Grand Mall, the band, split into the offs who made some records and kind of punk with some reggae and some ska in them, and the off Scott Dead Kennedys, their first gig. And uh, then the, the other half, um, with Will Shatter, started Negative Trend, who was the most volatile, just unruly, venue-trashing, politically militant band in San Francisco in their day. And then Will and the drummer would go on to start Flipper, after that, before Will died of drugs in the late 80s. 